Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Rebecca James, Biochemistry Faculty with Marrow. This session is the clinical edge video of biochemistry. We know that for every exam, two things is the most important factor. Number one is the high yield topic. Number two is the previous year question. And the second thing is that in the recent exam or in the coming next exam, what we are expecting is applied question. So, we have to learn these high yield topics and the previous year question in an applied manner. So, what we have done is we have taken the most important high yield or what we say as the high yield topics in an applied manner. And usually what we expect is an MCQ question, but these are not MCQs. This is a scenario will be discussed. Following that, there will be few questions. The aim is to discuss maximum points concerned with the scenario. And what I am trying to do is that for every scenario, Along with that, I will discuss the other scenarios. For example, if I am discussing a question on glycogen storage disorder, I will discuss what the scenario or what are the scenarios that we can expect in other glycogen storage disorder as well. So that we will get an overall idea of all the applied aspects in biochemistry in a short span of time. All these topics are discussed in the major videos. So, I won't be covering all the aspects, but the nutshell of every applied question is covered in this video. So, let's start. A two year old child with chubby cheeks, protuberant abdomen, thin upper limb, and the lower limb presented with the tiredness, especially in between meals. What's the peculiarity of in between meals? That is the time when the child is fasting. Physical examination revealed that there is hepatomegaly, there is renomegaly. Then, lab investigation blood glucose level is 40, that is low. Uric acid is 10 mg per deciliter, it is high. Serum lactate, what we expect is a 5 milliequivalents, but here it is 17 milliequivalents, so it is high. Rotheras test is positive, cholesterol level is also high. So, here we have to discuss what is the provisional diagnosis, what are the biochemical hallmarks, what are the, bio, what are the biochemical defect, enumerate other liver glycogen storage disorder with biochemical defect. So, what is the provisional diagnosis here? The provisional diagnosis here is a type 1 Glycogen storage disorder that is von Gerke's disease. Right? So, we will discuss the other aspects and then I will come back to this question. So, basically, this is about liver glycogen storage disorder. What is the function of liver glycogen? The function of liver glycogen is to so provide a source of blood glucose. We know that. So, if there is any problem in associated with the liver glycogen metabolism, then the source of blood glucose in early fasting is affected. So, the child is having features of hypoglycemia, especially during fasting. So, that is the first thing. Then, the next aspect of any liver glycogen storage disorder is hepatomegaly. The hallmark or the classical uh, picture of any storage disorder, we know that most of them have visceromegaly. So, in the liver glycogen storage disorder, we expect a hepatomegaly in every liver GSDs. So, if I am saying every liver GSD is uh, having hepatomegaly, is there any GSD with no hepatomegaly? In fact, it is not a GSD, but it is classified under GSD, and that is no hepatomegaly. It is type 0 glycogen storage disorder, which is a defect in glycogen synthase. Okay. So, coming to the other, what we can see is that the liver glycogen storage disorder, generally there is hypoglycemia in between meals or in the fasting stages. So, liver GSDs are of main, mainly type 1, type 3, and type 4 and type 
6. Okay. So, we know that the type 1 is otherwise called as von Gierke's disease. What is the additional visceromegaly that you can see in von Gierke's disease? There is renomegaly. There is renomegaly. Okay. What is the defect in biochemical defect in von Gierke's disease? It is glucose 6 phosphatase glucose 6-phosphatase. Then comes the type 3 which is otherwise Anderson disease. What is the biochemical defect here? A, B, C, D, right? So, this is branching enzyme. Okay. Now, in the type 4 which is the Curie's disease, the enzyme defect is D branching enzyme. In Herz disease, it is hepat Tick glycogen phosphorylase. Phosphorylase. So these are the enzyme defect. Now we'll see how they differ in its clinical presentation. So in that question, what we can see is the biochemical hallmarks of von Gierke's disease. So there is no doubt in diagnosing that case. So there is hypoglycemia, ketosis. So this is about the von Gierke's disease has hypoglycemia, ketosis. Then there is hyperuricemia, lactic acidosis and hyperlipidemia. All these biochemical hallmarks are there in type 1 which is von Gierke's disease. Now coming to the Anderson disease, here the biochemical hallmarks of hypoglycemia and ketosis is there because whenever there is hypoglycemia, there will be ketosis. But here the difference like in the Anderson disease and Cori's disease together, so we are discussing Anderson and Cori's disease together, the difference here is there is no hyperuricemia. There is no lactic acidosis. There is no hyperlipidemia. Hyperlipidemia. So, that is the peculiarity of Anderson disease. Then what are the additional feature that you can see in Anderson and the Cori's disease? Here, what we can see is there is features of liver failure. That is, there is features of cirrhosis, portal hypertension, okay. So, there is increased ALT and increased AST. So, in both Cori's and Anderson disease, we can see all these things. But, in, when we compare Anderson and Cori's disease, the difference is that it is the Cori's disease is less fatal when it is compa compared to Anderson disease. Anderson disease is a very fatal condition. Usually, death occurs uh, at about 5 years of age. So, this is a fatal condition. Death is usually at around 5 years of age. Then that is due to liver failure. Whereas the features of cirrhosis are usually reversible or not fatal in the case of Cori's disease. Okay. Now coming to the Herz disease. In the Herz disease, the defect is in glycogen phosphorylase. So only glycogenolysis is affected. So there is no severe hypoglycemia. Severe hypoglycemia is not there in Herz disease. So, we will see the biochemical defect of all the liver glycogen storage disorder together. So, what we have seen is that basically the problem is in the liver glycogen metabolism. We have already seen all these pathway. Uh, here, uh, what we, we know that the liver glycogen is first acted upon by glycogen phosphorylase. What is a very important vitamin required for glycogen phosphorylase? It is the PLP. Okay, now it is converted to a, uh, a, a polymer with the short branches and that is called liver de limit dextrin. So, every time the glucose is removed as glucose 1-phosphate, this glucose 1-phosphate is converted to glucose 6-phosphate by phosphoglucomutase and we know that it is converted to glucose by the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase. So, in von Gierke's disease, the defect is in the type 1 that is von Gierke's here is the defect. So, what will happen? We know that if uh, there is no, you can see that 
glucose six phosphate will be formed but no glucose so what will happen there is hypoglycemia so which means that there is hypoglycemia because of no glycogenolysis now if glycogen you know, glycogenolysis is not able to support the blood glucose what is the next source of blood glucose it is gluconeogenesis which means that we are using the non carb substrates uh, uh, non carb substrates and the non carb substrate is actually uh, various non carb substrate like the lactate the glycerol uh, the all the non carb substrate is getting converted to glucose but that also is finally converging to the point called as glucose 6 phosphate so that also needs to get converted to glucose is it possible no because the final culminating enzyme is not there so as a result what we can see is the non carb substrates is trying to increase or produce the glucose but it is not finally culminating in glucose which means that there is excess gluconeogenesis but there is no glucose right so as a result of this one very important intermediate of gluconeogenesis is depleted and that is oxaloacetate so there is depletion of oxaloacetate this we have to keep in mind because that only that helps us to find out the other biochemical features so there is severe hypoglycemia uh, and as a result so if the you know if the gluconeogenesis is not able to support the blood glucose then what will happen the next uh, source there is no other source of glucose but there is the next metabolic fuel to support the vital organs is the ketone bodies so how is this ketone bodies formed so the next is that we know that the triacylglycerols are being uh, used up where the hormone sensitive lipase is active where we can see that it produces fatty acid and the glycerol glycerol already is going for gluconeogenesis this fatty acid is converted to acetyl coenzyme a and what is that pathway called as it is called beta oxidation now this acetyl coenzyme a uh, has two fates either go to tca cycle or go to ketone bodies so here we know that if acetyl coenzyme a has to enter into ketone bodies what is required it has to combine with oxaloacetate but what i have told you is that oxaloacetate is depleted so this is not possible which means that all the acetyl coenzyme a is going for ketone body synthesis which result in another biochemical hallmark which is called ketosis so what we have seen is there is hypoglycemia hypoglycemia and ketosis then what about other biochemical hallmarks what we have seen is that the glucose 6 phosphate is excess here because it doesn't know where to go so this glucose 6 phosphate think that it goes to hmp shunt pathway so if it goes to hmp shunt pathway what is produced we know that the ribose is produced pentose sugar is produced so we know ribose is the source uh, produces what it is a starting substrate for purines right so from the purines when it is catabolized it produces what uric acid okay so this result in what hyperuricemia hyperuricemia another biochemical hallmark then what we have seen is that the glucose 6 phosphate is converted it's entering into glycolysis thinking that it can produce some atp so it is converted to pyruvate now the pyruvate can either go to acetyl coenzyme a in oxidative uh, phase or what you say as the like oxidative pathway we know that pyruvate can be converted to acetyl coenzyme a in anaerobic we know that it is converted to anaerobic glycolysis it is converted to lactate here what happened there is excess of acetyl coenzyme a right so there is excess of acetyl coenzyme a here means that there is excess of product which this excess of the product will inhibit this enzyme what is that enzyme there pyruvate dehydrogenase so pyruvate dehydrogenase is switched off because of excess acetyl coenzyme a but the so the pyruvate will go for what it go excess into lactate converted to lactate right 
So, there is lactic acidosis and why there is hyperlipidemia? The hyperlipidemia is because of there is excess acetyl coenzyme A, they does not know where to go, it can go for fatty acid synthesis, it can go for cholesterol synthesis and there is hyperlipidemia. So, these are the biochemical hallmarks of type 1 glycogen storage disorder. Now, we will go to that question once more where we can see the provisional diagnosis in that case was uh, type 1 where all the biochemical hallmarks are there. You can see there is hepatomegaly, renomegaly, hypoglycemia, hyperuricemia, lactic acidosis, ketone bodies, hyperlipidemia. So, all the features are there. Then biochemical hallmarks we have discussed. What is a biochemical defect also we have discussed. And we have just discussed the other liver glycogen storage disorder. So, a scenario if it is coming in other liver glycogen storage disorder also I have explained along with the discussion of this question. So, let us go to the next question. So, this is about a 16 year old student presented with lethargy and high colored urine especially during workout in the gym. The physical trainer checked his blood glucose level during the symptom using a glucometer. It was found to be very low because he is feeling tired whenever the, this person is doing some workout. So, he went to a physician for further workup and enzyme was found to be defective. So, what is the probable diagnosis? What is the biochemical defect? And enumerate other metabolic disorders associated like almost linked to this. So, we will discuss the next set of question that is about the muscle glycogen storage disorder. So, unlike liver glycogen, muscle glycogen, what is the function? The muscle glycogen, the function is to provide ATP during exercise. That is the function of muscle glycogen. Not, it is not a source of blood glucose during fasting. So, muscle glycogen, if that is the function, uh, if any problem that happens in the muscle glycogen metabolism, what will be affected? Exercise is the point where the symptoms are appearing. So, pain during exercise or tiredness because of hypoglycemia because all the muscle is using the glucose from the blood. So, there is hypoglycemia during exercise. Then it is a clincher towards the muscle glycogen storage disorder. Okay, so how will you classify muscle glycogen storage disorder? We know that it is classified into uh, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and without hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the presentation is a bit diff different where there is cardiomegaly and uh, cardiomegaly there is uh, those children is actually a severe condition mostly they will be hypotonic then there is uh, respiration will be difficult because of the hypotonia even the diaphragm is affected so there is difficulty in breathing there is uh, cardiomegaly and usually the child dies at around two years of age due to cardiac failure right so you got a hint this is about type to glycogen storage disorder and that is Pompey's disease. It is a lysosomal storage disorder. Only LSD in the GS glycogen storage disorder is the Pompey's disease. So, here the acid maltase or acid alpha 1 glucosidase enzyme is defective. So, it is a peculiar enzyme, a special enzyme uh, where a few uh, amount of glycogen uh, glycogenolysis is taking place in the lysosomes which is affected here. So, glycogen is not able to lyse. So, what will happen? The glycogen get accumulated in the lysosomes. The lysosomes is getting uh, distorted. It is getting damaged and that is how Pompey's disease. Right. Now, we go to the other one which is not a fatal condition but symptomatic. So, without hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so we do not expect a hypotonia, we do not expect a cardiomegaly here. So, here they usually present with the tiredness during exercise. Okay. Uh, so, here uh, there are two types under this that is type 5 and type 7. The type 5 is what? The McCardle's disease. This is the most common muscle glycogen storage disorder. 
muscle glycogen. In the liver glycogen storage disorder, which is the most common, that is von Gerke's disease. Among the muscle, it is the uh, McCordell's disease. And where is the defect here? The defect is in muscle or myo phosphorylase, or we can say that muscle glycogen phosphorylase, right? Uh, here, uh, the myo, the clinical features, I will just compare. Uh, let me finish the next one also. That is type 7. So, type 7 is otherwise Tarui's disease. Where is the enzyme defect here? Muscle and erythrocyte phosphofractokinase. This is the enzyme defect. Okay. So, how do they present differently? In the case of McCardle's disease, Exercise intolerance is there. So, that I have already commonly discussed. That is, there is exercise intolerance. Right. Now, myoglobinuria. Myoglobinuria is present. Myoglobinuria is present in McCardle's disease as well as Tarui's disease. So, there is a burgundy colored urine. High colored urine is there. Then second win phenomenon, that means that the pain arises during exercise. Then after some time, if the patient rests for some time, then the, he can do exercise with more ease, which is called second wind phenomenon. It's positive for McCardle's, but it is negative for Tardewey's disease. So, this is how we can differentiate if a scenario is asked. Then hemolysis. We know that erythrocyte PFK is required for the RBC metabolism, which is affected here. So, hemolysis is a feature of Tardewey's disease. Not not a feature of McCardle's disease. Blood lactate. Blood lactate level, lactate is produced from glycogen. How? Glycogen is converted to glucose 6-phosphate, but in the muscle there is no glucose 6-phosphatase. This glucose 6-phosphate, if the muscle is exercising, it enters into anaerobic glycolysis and produces lactate. So, that is the source of lactate in the muscle, especially during the exercise. But here, Muscle glycogen phosphorylase is not there or PFK is not there, which means that glycogen cannot is converted to glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, like in the muscle glycogen phosphorylase defect, it is not converted. But in the other case, it can be converted to glucose 6-phosphate. But whatever is the case, whether it is a PFK deficiency, glycolysis is affected. Glycogen phosphorylase deficiency, then glucose 6-phosphate itself is not produced uh, that much. So, uh, ultimately, what is happening is that lactate should be produced from glucose 6-phosphate, which is not happening, which means that the blood lactate level is decreased in either, in either of these cases, the blood lactate level is decreased during exercise. But during exercise, what we usually expect is blood lactate level is high. But in this case, if there is a muscle GST, the blood lactate level is reduced. So, this is how we differentiate between various muscle glycogen storage disorder. So, now we will go back to that question. So, 16 year old, usually the muscle glycogen storage disorder, particularly the most common one, the McCordell's disease is usually seen in adolescent age group. So, they present with lethargy, high colored urine, especially after doing workout. So, that is saying that during exercise. Then, there is hypoglycemia during exercise because the blood is taking up all the glucose from the uh, blood, uh, like muscle is taking all the glucose from the blood. So, there is hypoglycemia. It was found to be very low and uh, what is the probable diagnosis? So, whenever such question is asked, Basically, we have to say the most common one as the answer, not Tarui's disease. You know, if we want to say Tarui's disease, there is extra features like hemolysis is there, then we can say it as Tarui's. Pompis, def def definitely we know that it is not Pompis because we know that it is a very poor prognosis condition. The death occurs very early. So, 16 year, it is unlikely. So, here the most probable diagnosis is McCardle's disease. So, that is type 5. Then what is the biochemical defect? I have already discussed. It is muscle glycogen phosphorylase and other any, uh, metabolic disorders also we have discussed. So, now we will go to the next question. A neonate two weeks admitted in NICU with convulsion coma. Now, she is in a comatose state. 
her mother complained that the child was irritable with feeding and poor weight gain the child is jaundiced and hypoglycemic hepatomegaly present urine benedict's test is positive glucose oxidase test is negative so what is the probable diagnosis biochemical defect the doctor advised an ophthalmologic examination why what are the investigation and what is the treatment okay so we will discuss all these question later so that was a case of classic galactosemia so what is the biochemical defect in classic galactosemia uh, so this is the pathway which is affected in classic galactosemia that is a galactose metabolism we know that the galactose is converted to galactose one phosphate by the enzyme galactokinase okay this galactose one phosphate you know what is the use of galactose it is used for the synthesis of lactose and synthesis of glycosaminoglycans and other glycoproteins okay so if it is needed for these metabolism it has to be converted to udp galactose so how is it possible galactose one phosphate is converted to glucose one phosphate and here the udp glucose is coming this udp glucose become udp galactose so now the galactose is udp galactose this udp galactose is used as a source of synthesis of lactose so this is used for the synthesis of lactose then this is used for the synthesis of glycosaminoglycan and other glycoproteins so this is how galactose is used for various synthesis but if the body is not requiring uh, galactose for all this synthesis then what will happen the udp galactose is converted back to udp glucose so this is by an enzyme udp hexose udp hexose epimerase okay so in between i uh, there is one very important enzyme also which convert galactose one phosphate it is galactose one phosphate where we can see that the udp group is, is being transferred so it is galactose one phosphate uridyl transferase Okay, that is what we call or short form is GALT, right? So here the in classic galactosemia the defect is in the GALT enzyme. So that is classic galactosemia. Classic galactosemia. So what happens here is the galactose one phosphate accumulate. It's a very toxic compound because the galactose one phosphate if it is formed we know that the galactose one for the for uh, all the phosphate that is the inorganic phosphate is trapped here so pi means inorganic phosphate is trapped so what happens is that there is a de de depletion of atp and again what we uh, know is that as the galactose one phosphate it affects the liver so there is um, hepatomegaly there is liver failure there is jaundice all these features are there then what we can see is that as the phosphates are being trapped here there is decreased activation we know that uh, there is decreased activation of an enzyme glycogen phosphorylase why because this is an enzyme active in a phosphorylated state we know that the covalent modification this is a uh, enzyme of fasting stage so it is active in phosphorylated state so if the enzyme has to be phosphorylated we need phosphate but all the phosphates are now trapped as galactose one phosphate which trap all the inorganic phosphate hence this phosphorylation of the enzyme is not possible so there is decreased glycogenolysis so what will happen there is fasting hypoglycemia okay so it's a very toxic condition that is classic galactosemia the liver is affected then glycogenolysis is affected all the features are there now the next thing is that what are the other galactosemias there are other non classic galactosemia number one is a defect in galactokinase it is a benign condition unlike galactosemia uh, classic galactosemia 
the only manifestation here is cataract what cataract oil drop cataract right uh, now the other enzyme which causes a non classic galactosemia i'm just writing nc here it is non classic galactosemia okay so this is the biochemical defect in classic galactosemia uh, so next thing that we should understand how we can identify a case if it's a, a, a patient is presented to you with galactosemia age of onset is very important so the age of onset here we can see in this case, it is a neonate of 2 weeks age. So, if the, what is the trigger point here or the trigger factor here? It is breast milk. Breast feeding is the triggering factor here because the breast milk contain lactose. Lactose contain galactose. So, that is the galactose metabolism is affected. So, all the features will be seen. It is a very, uh, it is a uh, it's a severe condition. The child present with convulsion, it's comatose, irritable, poor weight gain. All these features are there. Liver is affected. So, jaundice, hypoglycemia, hepatomegaly. And now coming to the next, that is, so what we have seen is how it will present. The age of onset and other clinical features. Uh, next thing is that... Um, glucose oxidase test. Benedict's test is positive. Why? Because in this case... Galactose is excreted. Galactose one phosphate, and if there is no inorganic phosphate, what will happen? All the galactose is not getting converted to gal because already all phosphates are trapped as galactose one phosphate. Whatever excess galactose we are taking is is seen as galactose, and that is excreted in urine. So we know galactose is a reducing sugar, so it is positive. And then whenever we get a reducing sugar or Benedict's test positive, the first thing that is coming to our mind is glucose. So, that is why usually in the scenario every question what we can see as the next sentence is glucose oxidase test is negative which means that this reducing sugar is not glucose. So, it is something else. So, age of onset, reducing substance present but it is not glucose. So, all these are hint that tells you that it is a case of galactosemia. Okay, so, the probable diagnosis is classic galactosemia, biochemical defect is the GALT defect, galactose 1-phosphate urodial transferase defect and what is the next question? The doctor advised an ophthalmologic examination. So, what we see here is we, ex we see is an oil drop cataract. Why? Because if there is excess, I have told you all the inorganic phosphate is trapped, the glucose is galactose 1-phosphate and what? our excess galactose we are taking is seen as galactose itself and this galactose if it is accumulating it enter into the eyes okay so in the eyes there is an enzyme called aldose reductase right so this is uh, this aldose reductase enzyme converts a polyol pathway where the galactose is converted to galactictol galactictol or dulcitol fine so this galactictol or dulcitol is the one which causes oil drop cataract in galactosemia so i will show you another scenario which is almost similar to this but it is not galactosemia so, that is this scenario that is you can see that in this case an infant of 6 month age. It is not a neonate of 1 week or 2 week. It is 6 month age. Similar features with vomiting, seizures, lethargy, feeding difficulty, poor weight gain, all the features, hypoglycemia, Benedict's test is positive, glucose oxidase test is negative, all the features are there. Here, the difference is there is no cataract. In the question that I have given prior or as a question is also no cataract because in but the doctor has advised to do a ophthalmologic examination. In this case, uh, there is no hint that suggesting of a ophthalmologic examination or it is given there is no cataract like that. And again, what we can see is the 
age of onset the age of onset is six month so what is the trigger in the six months so that a similar picture of hypoglycemia liver failure jaundice hepatomegaly is there so six month is the time when we start supplementary nutrition or the weaning so during the weaning we give fructose in the diet so this is a case of so no cataract age of onset is six months then it's a clue that it's a hereditary fructose intolerance hereditary fructose intolerance and what is the enzyme defect here here the enzyme defect is aldolase b right okay so uh, that is about galactosemia along with i discussed the uh, uh, the fruct uh, hereditary fructose intolerance as well almost similar clinical picture and I have already explained what is the difference. So, two questions that uh, we have to answer uh, is what are the investigations to be done in the case of classic galactosemia? The investigation to be done is we can do specific tests for galactose like music acid test. But these are all uh, old tests and all. So, newer test is we have to do the enzyme studies. And we can do the genetic mutation studies. Okay. Now, what is the treatment? For galactosemia, the treatment is we have to, it is an absolute contraindication of breastfeeding. So, breastfeeding is should be avoided. So, what is the next treatment? A lactose free diet till 4 to 5 years because one enzyme called as galactose 1-phosphate pyrophosphorylase. This enzyme becomes active by 4 to 5 years. So, we can uh, withhold the treatment of lactose free diet after 4 to 5 years, right? Because this enzyme will convert the galactose 1 phosphate back to galactose. So, all the problems is because of trapping of inorganic phosphate as galactose 1 phosphate, which can be prevented here, right? So, we will go to the next question. So, next question is a 6 month old child brought to the casualty with excessive vomiting, drowsiness, seizure, coma. The child taken to casualty and IV glucose given. The child responded. After six months, the child was again admitted. On further evaluation, uh, his blood glu uh, glutamine level is elevated. So, that is the point there. The blood glutamine level is elevated and excretion of pyrimidines. So, these two points always uh, it's a hint towards hyperammonemias. Hyperammonemia is seen in urea cycle disorder or it can be a secondary hyperammonemia. But in this age group, what we have to see, uh, what we have to rule out is a primary hyperammonemia uh, or a uh, congenital defect in the, or genetic defect in the urea cycle enzyme. So, that is pointing towards hyperammonemia. So, we will discuss about hyperammonemia, then we will answer these questions. So, we know that urea cycle is a metabolic cycle that is uh, for the metabolism of or the disposal of ammonia in our body where the ammonia is uh, converted to urea and the urea is the how uh, is excreted through urine through the uh, by, by the kidneys, right. So, this is a cycle that is taking place inside the liver. The most only five enzymes are there where first we see that the carbon dioxide is converted to carbamyl phosphate. The enzyme is carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1. Then it combines with ornithine. The enzyme is ornithine transcarbamylase. It forms citrulline. These two steps takes place inside the mitochondria. Further, it comes out of the mitochondria where it combines with aspartate to form arginosuccinate. And this arginosuccinate is lysed by giving off fumarate and becomes arginine. And arginine is hydrolyzed uh, by adding water to ammonia and ornithine. And thus, the ornithine is reformed here. We will just see the urea cycle disorders here where we can see that if the defect is in first enzyme CBS1, then it causes hyperammonemia type 1. 
if there is a defect is in second enzyme it causes hyperammonemia type 2 okay so here let me tell you about the excretion of pyrimidine because we have seen increased glutamine which i'll discuss uh, next is what is given in that question is excretion of pyrimidines how because I have told you it is a case of hyperammonemia whether it is hyperammonemia type 1 or type 2 excretion of pyrimidines is the one which differentiate between these two either excretion of pyrimidines or in the question there can be increased orotic acid. So, if these two points are there it is pointing towards hyperammonemia type 2. This is the most common urea cycle disorder if there is a defect in ornithine transcarbamylase then what will happen is this carbamyl phosphate is seeping into the or spill into the cytoplasm and here this carbamyl phosphate is going for pyrimidine. There is another pathway which can use this carbamyl phosphate that is to pyrimidine synthesis. So, during pyrimidine synthesis there is a one important intermediate is orotate because it is a when it is accumulating it crystallizes that is how it becomes important or it becomes symptom symptoms is uh, because of this accumulation of orotate right. So, if there is increased orotic acid or if there is increased pyrimidine that is pointing towards hyperammonemia type 2 and this is the most common urea cycle disorder it is usually seen in males because it is a X-linked partially dominant or an X-linked recessive condition. X-linked recessive or we can say X-linked partially dominant condition. So, that is hyperammonemia type 2. Now, uh, why there is uh, increased glutamine? So, if the ammonia is not being fixed by combining with carbon dioxide and becomes carbamyl phosphate. So, if it does a defect in one or first or the second enzyme, there is excess of ammonia. We know that ammonia is, uh, uh, it is for detoxifying the ammonia, the first line defense of ammonia is ammonia combines with glutamate to form glutamine. This is how the in the blood the ammonia is transported. So, whenever there is hyperammonemia, excess of glutamate is combining with ammonia and it becomes glutamine, right? It becomes glutamine. So, that is why the in hyperammonemia there is increased plasma glutamine, okay? So, these two is pointing towards it is a case of hyperammonemia type 2. So, we will just uh, see the other urea cycle disorders as well where we can see the citrulline is coming out. It combines with aspartate enzyme is aspart A uh, arginosuccinate synthetase. If it is defective, it causes citrullinemia. So, now onwards one or other uh, derived amino acid is, uh, is seen in excess. So, previously we cannot see any amino acid uh, or specific or special amino acid being uh, in excess, but here onwards what we can see is excess of amino acid. So, here it is an amino acid, it is a derived amino acid called citrulline is accumulating. So, in the next enzyme arginosuccinate lyase is defective, another derived amino acid called arginosuccinate accumulate and it is called arginino succinic aciduria, aciduria. Okay. So, here uh, one important for thing that we have to identify is that a very important clinical feature called trichorexis that is easily breakable trichorexis nodosa. Okay. Then the arginase defect, it is a different presentation. If a scenario of arginase defect is asked, usually there is leads to hyperammonemia and they present with a spastic quadriplegia or paraplegia with a uh, scissoring lower limbs, scissoring of lower limbs. So, that is seen in arginase defect. Okay. So, that is arginemia. Then there are two transporters that can be defective here. One is this transporter which transport ornithine from the cytoplasm to the mitochondria. So, if that is defect, it causes hyperammonemia, hyperornithinemia and homocitrullinuria syndrome, HHH syndrome. Then another transporter that is defect is here, which is called as a citrine transporter. It is a citrine.
string transporter which is a transporter of this aspartic acid so it is a transporter of aspartic acid it causes citrullinemia type 2 okay so these are the urea cycle disorders uh, so first uh, we'll see how we'll differentiate between various urea cycle disorders usually the age of presentation is a very young age group that is an infant infants presented with uh, vomiting seizures poor weight gain feeding difficulty feeding difficulty convulsion and coma so these are the cl usual clinical presentation in a, almost every disorder in a infancy or neonate so all the features are there then what in the investigation what we can see is that there is blood ammonia level elevated or sometimes it can be blood glutamine level elevated so it, it says that ammonia is elevated then arterial blood gas analysis if we are seeing you can see either ph is increased or it can be normal because respiratory alkalosis is a feature of urea cycle disorder so respiratory alkalosis so then ph is elevated or normal because of compensation then what we have to do is the specific amino acid elevation so specific amino acid elevation branch can be either positive or negative that is if there is specific amino acid elevation although there cannot be any specific amino acid elevation so specific amino acid elevation is from citrulline onwards so citrulline can be elevated so then that condition is called citrullinemia Ornithine can be elevated, then that is triple H syndrome. Argininosuccinic aciduria. If argininosuccinate is elevated, if there is arginine elevation, that is argininemia. Okay, so that is one branch. So if there is no specific amino acid elevation, then what we have to look for is plasma orotate level. Plasma orotate level can be plus or minus. So, if there is excess plasma orotate, it means that it is hyperammonemia type 2 and the other one is hyperammonemia type 1, right. So, these are, this is how we differentiate between various urea cycle disorders. So, going back to the question, what we can see is almost all the features of urea cycle disorder, blood glutamine level elevate, elevated, pyrimidine, so that is hyperammonemia type 2. Biochemical defect is an ornithine transcarbamylase defect. Investigation, I have already told you, arterial blood gas analysis, blood ammonia level, specific amino acid elevation, all these can be looked for. Then other metabolic disorder also we have discussed. Okay, now we go to the next question. So the next question is a two-year-old mentally retarded child brought to pediatric OPD with complaints of agitated behavior, peculiar mousy odor or smell. So, fair skin and the hair was blonde. So, that itself tells you or it, uh, it is a hint so that it is a case of penile ketonuria. Then, how it is different from albinism? In albinism, there is no mental retardation, number one. Number two, it is actually a, uh, this is a fair skin blonde. There is not a complete deep pigmentation. In albinism, it is a milky white, milky white hair like that. It, then, it is albinism. And another uh, hint that it is phenylketonuria is that there is mousy body odor, which is seen only in phenylketonuria, not in albinism. So, that is the probable diagnosis here is classic phenylketonuria. The biochemical defect is an enzyme called phenylalanin hydroxylase. And what is the reason for fair skin? That we will see in the biochemical defect. So, we discuss very shortly the phenylketonuria where we can see phenylalanine metabolism is affected. We know that phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine. The enzyme is phenylalanine hydroxylase. This enzyme is defective. So, what will happen? The tyrosine is not formed. Tyrosine, we know it can either enter into catabolic fate that is both ketogenic as well as glucogenic fate or it goes to some specialized products. So, in the specialized products, we know that it can synthesize catecholamines like dopamine, norepinephrine and epinephrine, thyroid hormones and it can synthesize melanin. So, this will explain why there is fair skin. Fair skin, blonde hair. 
because of decreased melanin synthesis because this is affected then because of there is uh, decreased neurotransmitters catecholamines thyroid hormones all these are required for the normal function of the brain we know that so that is why there is agitation then intellectual disability so because of neurotransmitter deficiency and decreased synthesis of thyroid hormones so what will happen phenylalanine is not getting converted to tyrosine means phenylalanine is entering into other alternate metabolic pathways alternate pathways so when it enter into alternate pathways phenyl pyruvate is uh, phenyl alanine you know alanine can be converted to pyruvate so phenyl alanine is converted to phenyl pyruvate it is a keto acid right uh, so it is so that is why this disorder is called phenyl ketonuria because this is a this is a keto acid that is ex excessively excreted through the urine then this phenyl pyruvate pyruvate can be converted to ester coenzyme a pyruvate can be converted to lactate similarly phenyl pyruvate can be converted to phenyl acetate and phenyl lactate so here i should say about this that is the mousy body order the mousy body order is because of phenyl acetate okay now that is about the phenyl ketonuria now again one more question that you can expect in or you can get in the aromatic amino acid concerned with phenylalanine and tyrosine very common is the alkaptonuria how what is the scenario for that it's usually a middle age or if it's an infant then the mother will give the history of blackish discoloration of urine when i wash the clothes of the child or in a middle aged person blackish discoloration of urine on standing not a freshly voided urine then black pigment sometimes it can be a black pigmentation on the dorsum of the hands and in the white of the eyes that is the sclera of the eyes then intellectual disability is it there no there is no intellectual disability and usually because of the accumulation of the or uh, the alkyptone bodies in the vertebra there is or intervertebral space then they, it causes a condition called as ochronosis and that causes low backache so that is a case of alkaptonuria alkaptonuria and the enzyme defect there is homogentisate oxidase okay so this is another question that we have to discuss along with it so we'll go back to the question so what is the reason for fair skin already discussed what are the investigations the investigations what we can do is old test like biochemical test are there which is ferric chloride test then another test is called guthrie's test then newer tests like enzyme studies genetic mutation studies is there then chromatography you can do then high performance liquid chromatography where all the metabolites can be uh, separated and identified all these tests can be done for phenylketonuria as well treatment option the treatment option for uh, phenylketonuria is phenylalanine restricted diet phenylalanine restricted diet is the number one then the second treatment is a large neutral amino acid concentrate a concentrate of large neutral amino acid and another treatment is a synthetic bh4 that is uh, tetrahydrobiopterin a synthetic that is called saprobiopterin dihydrochloride otherwise it is called kuvan kuvan so these are the treatment options for phenylketonuria so we will go to the next question a 3 year old child with intellectual disability developed visual disturbance on examination that that uh, child is tall and thin uh, with elongated limbs scoliosis present lens is subluxated high arched palate genu valgum so skeletal deformity is there intellectual disability is there a metabolic disorder is diagnosed on evaluation what is the probable diagnosis so this is pointing towards homocysteinuria homocysteinuria what is the biochemical defect the biochemical defect of 
classic homocysteinureas cystathionine beta synthase beta synthase so we will see that uh, how what what is a biochemical defect and then we'll come back to these questions so in classic homocysteinuria the usual scenario that you can get is usually a child with intellectual disability skeletal deformity lots of skeletal deformities can be given in the question uh, like uh, tall then they usually they are thin then the sternum deformities like pectus carinatum pectus excavatum then knee deformities the ankle deformities then the pes cavus uh, then high arched palate then another thing is that elongated limbs and also fingers is elongated that is called arachnodactyly and there is a characteristic gait for them that is called charlie chaplin gait so these are the skeletal deformities then ectopia lentis so that will in the history what we can get is visual disturbance or decreased vision and iridodonesis where we can see that the iris is twitching movements in the iris but that is also another presentation that can be given presented to the ophthalmology opd then thromboembolism thromboembolism because of excess homocysteine the there is increased chance of thrombos, thrombosis and this causes they usually present in emergency de department as a stroke uh, or it can be as a coronary artery disease so this is the scenario that we can expect in homocysteinuria almost every features is similar like especially if you see the uh, skeletal deformity ectopia lentis and all it's almost similar to another syndrome what is it marfan syndrome but the difference in the case of marfan and the uh, homocysteinuria is usually in homocysteinuria the dislocation of lens is downwards whereas marfan means you think about fan fan it is upright so marfan the, uh, the dislocation of the lens is towards up so that's one difference and intellectual disability is usually not seen in marfan syndrome but in homocysteinuria there is intellectual disability thromboembolism also you can uh, see you can see in marfan syndrome so what is the biochemical defect here biochemical defect is in the metabolism of sulfur containing amino acid i have already given that uh, sulfur containing amino acid metabolism here you are all aware of it i just tell you where is the defect in this the first defect is we know methionine is converted to s adenosyl methionine later to homocysteine homocysteine can combine with serine that is by the enzyme cystathionine beta synthase so it causes it becomes cystathionine and cysteine and homocysteine so the defect is in cystathionine beta synthase so what accumulate homocysteine accumulate and what is the deficient uh, uh, amino acid here cysteine there is decreased cysteine level and this causes classic homocysteinuria classic Whereas the non classic homocysteinuria can be of two defect. Either uh, the defect can be in the formation of, like this is uh, non classic is in the branch where or in the part where homocysteine is converted back to methionine by adding a methyl group. So, for that, we need two vitamins tetrahydrofolic acid, that is uh, folate or B9 and B12. So, if there is a methyl B12 formation defect or if there is a formation defect of N5 methyl THFA, so N5 methyl THFA formation or methyl B12 formation defect, it causes non classic. So, in non classic, the difference is that the cysteine level is normal, but here what we can see is methionine is not formed. So, there is decreased methionine, but cysteine level is normal. This is how we differentiate between classic and non-classic. So, that is about uh, the homocysteinuria. Uh, now, in this, uh, how we investigate this case? In the case, in investigation, there is a test which is called cyanide nitroprusside test. 
prosite test it is biochemical test the newer test or of course it is the mutation studies enzyme analysis then high performance liquid chromatography where the metabolites can be separated and analyzed so all these are the investigation then what is the treatment in the case of uh, classic homocysteinuria what we can give is we have to supplement cysteine because cysteine is not formed here supplement cysteine so second is vitamin b uh, vitamin b supplement either b6 it is the most important the primary one is b6 because the cystathione in beta synthase the coenzyme uh, form b6 is the one which is the vitamin required for cystathione in beta synthase or b12 and b9 because all this helps in the conversion of homocysteine either to cystathionine or to methionine because homocysteine accumulation is the problem then another treatment is betaine it is a uh, trimethylglycine where it has methyl group so this methyl group will methylate the homocysteine and get converted to methionine so methionine accumulation is not problem homocysteine accumulation can be prevented so for that we give betaine so these are the treatment option now in the sulfur containing amino acid apart from uh, homocysteinuria one more scenario that we can expect is a case of uh, cysteinuria so cysteinuria is a uh, usually it's a uh, usually given like uh, cysteine uh, cysteinuria what is what we give is a transport defect causes excretion of cola in urine what is cola it is cysteine it is not cysteine it is cysteine two cysteine joined together is cysteine cysteine okay so cysteine is excreted ornithine is excreted lysine and arginine so these are all dibasic amino acid so the defect is in a dibasic amino acid transporter so if any hint like this is there it's a case of cysteinuria where cysteine or ine is excreted not eine cysteine is not the one that is excreted remember that so in that question the what are the investigations to be done that we have discussed how this can be treated is also discussed so that is about the metabolism of sulfur containing amino acid and the applied aspect of it now going to the next question an infant normal at birth developed poor feeding vomiting in the first week of life later uh, became lethargic seizure developed baby showed boxing movement with hands and legs the parents noticed a sweet smell of caramel in the baby so what is the diagnosis the probable diagnosis here is maple syrup urine disease okay which are the amino acid that is excreted so that we'll see in the biochemical defect so maple syrup urine disease the most important thing is the age of onset is very early in age almost in the first week of life they present with hypotonia with bouts of hypotonia that is why this boxing movement or sometimes it can be given as a cycling movement or kicking movement like that so uh, another thing is that as usual in any case of a, pay, uh, a child that is presenting in a very early age they present with feeding difficulty poor uh, weight gain lethargy convulsion coma so that is here also plus what we can see is usually a smell of burnt sugar which gives you a hint that it's a case of msud or a caramel order or a maple syrup order right so this is how it presents and what is the biochemical defect here it's a defect in the metabolism of branched chain amino acid so very shortly if we are discussing uh, the bra branched chain amino acid uh, is converted to branched chain keto acid by transaminase the next enzyme is the one which is defective here which converts the keto acid to an acyl corresponding acyl so what is the branched chain keto acid dehydrogenase it is a multi enzyme complex with the three enzyme activities are there the first is it is a branched chain decarboxylase bck branched chain decarboxylase dihydrolipoyl transacylase and dihydrolipomide dehydrogenase these are the three enzyme activities now these three enzymes is coded by a gene like the first enzyme is coded by two genes one alpha and one beta 
the second enzyme is coded by a gene called this is called e1 alpha and the second is e1 beta the next is uh, a gene called e2 g e2 gene and the third enzyme is by a e3 gene okay so if there is a defect in e1 alpha it causes type 1a msud if there is a defect in 1 beta, it causes type 1 B MSUD. Here, if it is a defect, it causes type 2 MSUD. Here, it is type 3 MSUD. These are the types of MSUD. So, what will happen if there is a defect in this uh, branch chain keto acid? It can be any of this gene defect. It can be any of this MSUD. But whatever is it, branch chain keto acid is not getting converted to SL coenzyme. So, what will happen? this is accumulated so this is excreted in urine in urine so this branched chain keto acid is excreted in urine and that is the one which gives rotheras test positive and another test is dinitrophenyl hydrazine test DNPH test is positive and what are the amino acid that is other amino acid that are excreted as the branched chain keto acid is excreted there can be chances that uh, branched chain amino acid is also excreted in urine that is VIL or LIV which are they they are the valine isoleucine and leucine so these are the amino acid that are excreted so, uh, we will see that question. So, this is a case of uh, MSUD where we can see the amino acid that are exc excreted in the urine of the baby are the branched chain amino acid that is leucine, isoleucine and valine. So, going to the next question, a chronic alcoholic developed dyspnea, swelling of legs, on examination heart rate is increased, chest x-ray showed cardiomegaly to rule out a vitamin deficiency which investigation has to be done so this is a case of um, high output cardiac failure causing or uh, vitamin deficiency that affects the heart what is that called as it is wet beriberi wet beriberi so in this case what we can see is uh, high output cardiac failure cardiomegaly is seen and usually what is the importance of alcoholic there you know alcohol inhibit the absorption of a vitamin called vitamin b1 that is thiamine so this is a case of wet beriberi because of thiamine deficiency so what is the investigation that we have to do if there is a thiamine deficiency it is erythrocyte Transketolase. This is the enzyme activity that we have to see in B1 deficiency. So, we will just see which are the other questions that we can expect in B1 deficiency. So, B1 is thiamine. The active form is thiamine pyrophosphate or thiamine diphosphate. The source is very important because that can be given as a hint in the scenario. That is very important is the grains that is the wheat and other cereals so in the cereals especially in the aluron layer so in the question usually it is given that the patient consuming polished rice so in polished rice unlike parboiled rice in polished rice the aluron layer is lost so a patient consuming lot of polished rice will be there in the history then uh, what are the enzymes that you can give us you know which all enzymes are affected so you should be knowing what is the coenzyme activity of thiamine so most important is the three multi enzyme complex three multi enzyme complex are the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase pyruvate dehydrogenase and thus what we have discussed just now branched chain keto acid dehydrogenase so these three multi enzyme complex require b1 then the next important which is not a multi enzyme uh, multi enzyme complex 
but another enzyme is transketolase. This enzyme is an enzyme for HMP pathway, particularly seen in the RBC. So that is why we check for erythrocyte uh, transketolase because the RBC, you know, it's very easily accessible. In the blood, we can uh, get into the RBC and we can, through the blood, we can get the RBC and there we can estimate the level of or uh, estimate the activity of transketolase. Okay, now uh, what are the scenarios that we can expect? In a B1 deficiency, if it's a case of wet beriberi, then high output cardiac failure. So, there will be features of peripheral edema, cardiomegaly and usually a patient consuming lot of polished rice or an alcoholic. So, all these hints will be there. Then another uh, manifestation of deficiency is what is called as when there is a manifestation called tingling sensation in the or numbness uh, or paresthesia in the periphery. So, that is suggestive of peripheral neuropathy peripheral neuropathy and that is called what? It is called the dry beriberi. Okay. The next uh, is uh, another manifestation or scenario that can be given as the patient presented with the tosses of the eyelid, then the decreased vision because of uh, optic neuropathy which causes or ophthalmoplegia. So, these are because of ophthalmoplegia where optic nerve can be affected or uh, th that is why there is uh, the because of that ophthalmoplegia there is tosses of eyelid. Then imbalance that is because of triangle ataxia. Then involuntary movement of the eyes that is called nystagmus especially horizontal nystagmus. So, if these are the scenarios that is asked, it is suggestive of vernix encephalopathy. Okay. Again, all the features of vernix encephalopathy plus if there is anything like there is decreased memory or decreased alertness in an otherwise normal not uh, in a normal person, he was normal or she was normal, but now there is decreased memory, there is decreased alertness and psychotic behavior. All these are saying that it is Wernix, I am just writing the short form, Wernix Korsakoff syndrome. Okay, so this is are the different deficiency manifestations of vitamin B1. Uh, another question, a child from low socioeconomic status presented with ulceration in the sides of the mouth and fissuring of lips. On examination, magenta colored tongue, blood investigation measure activity of glutathione reductase uh, uh, by F FAD, that uh, flavin adenine dinucleotide added in vitro, uh, which is the vitamin deficiency suspected to active forms of the vitamin. So, it is a very classical case of B2. B2 is what? Riboflavin. The two active forms of riboflavin are FMN and FAD. So, how uh, how this uh, case will present you like the B2 deficiency usually the presentation will be uh, a low socioeconomic status or nutritional deficiency something which is hinting that there is nutritional deficiency plus in the mouth there is chelosis, glossitis, fissure very important fishery uh, then eyes in the eyes thumb there can be corneal vascularization corneal vascularization which affects the vision then seboric dermatitis seboric dermatitis all these are hints a plus what we have uh, always most of the time one more hint will be there in the question that is erythrocyte glutathione reductase activity okay so this is vitamin b2 deficiency or riboflavin deficiency so active forms already discussed here right so we go to the next question 
So another question uh, in the vitamins is a 50 year old man living in an area where maize is a staple food. So maize eaters means that uh, maize is having a vitamin called niacin in a bound form called niacetin. So there is niacin deficiency. Niacin is vitamin B3. Staple diet notices erythematous rash around the neck. We know that it is a D of pellagra. What is that D? Dermatitis. Dermatitis of pellagra. What is the peculiarity of dermatitis in pellagra? It is photosensitive. So, usually the ulceration, rash, rash, everything you can see in the sun exposed area, which is the one that, that is why there is a classical uh, castles necklace. Okay, so vitamin deficiency suspected here is niacin deficiency that is B3. Uh, what are the two active forms of B3? It is NAD and NADPH. NADPH. Then how diet influences vitamin deficiency? Diet usually a uh, two staple diet can cause niacin deficiency. One is maize or corn maize or corn. Why? Because it is found in a bound form. Next is jowar or otherwise s-o-r-g-h-u-m sorghum sor just uh, you know different ways different people will pronounce in different way I just say s-o-r-g-u-m sorghum or jowar if it is uh, in this case what's the problem is it has high leucine content jowar so this leucine there is a problem this leucine inhibit an enzyme called quinolinate phosphoribosyl transferase qprts this enzyme is required for the conversion of tryptophan to niacin okay so there this causes a deficiency of niacin here so, what, what are the active forms already discussed? NAD and NADPH. Uh, the next question that we could expect is that what are the enzymes that are affected by niacin deficiency? The niacin effect NAD requiring enzymes and NADPH. So, how we can differ, simply say about which are the NAD requiring enzyme? Most dehydrogenases so many dehydrogenases almost everything require nad then nadph you remember it like this most reductases for example hmg coenzyme reductase folate reductase so most reductases require nadph so there is another question where uh, which are the uh, enzymes that uh, produce NADPH. So, that is NADPH generators. NADPH generators are one, the first two enzymes of HMP. HMP shunt pathway. The one very important enzyme is G6PD. The second is cytoplasmic isocitrate dehydrogenase. The third NADPH generator, it is not utilizer generator, it is the third one is malic enzyme. So, these are the NADPH generators. So, uh, that is about uh, the niacin and remember about the niacin, the deficiency if I am discussing, we know that niacin deficiency causes pellagra. There are three Ds for pellagra. We all know that dermatitis. So, usually the scenario will say that there is Dermatitis in the sun exposed areas, Kessel's necklace, dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia and what is the fourth D? Fourth D is death. That is very late only, death. Okay. So, these are the deficiencies and remember what are the other conditions that can cause pellagra? One, we can see pellagra in or pellagra like symptoms in carcinoid syndrome. The second is 
heart nubs disease the third is b6 deficiency plp deficiency can cause pellagra because b6 is required in the conversion of tryptophan to uh, niacin okay so b6 deficiency can cause pellagra one more point in the niacin is that there is toxicity for niacin toxicity unlike b complex vitamins which does not cause toxicity there are two exceptions that cause toxicity one is niacin the second one is b6 so b3 accumulation or uh, niacin toxicity it causes prostaglandin mediated flushing one number two fulminant hepatitis the third is it cause glucose intolerance excess of niacin can cause glucose intolerance so these are the manifestation of niacin toxicity so going to the next question a software engineer who is a strict vegan develop tiredness tingling sensation so there is numbness so that is suggestive of a peripheral neuropathy he looks pale that is anemia on investigation peripheral smear showed macrocytic anemia along with elevated homocysteine which nutrient deficiency should be suspected in this case so there are two possibilities it can be either a folate deficiency that is b9 or folate defect or it can be a b12 deficiency then how can we differentiate between these two from the history strict vegan so strict vegan you know folic acid is present only in plant sources so that's why that's we can remember folium means leaves so it's present in plant source what about b12 it is present only in animal sources so a strict to vegan means that he is or she is devoid of b12 so most probably this should be a b12 deficiency as this uh, patient or this case is a uh, strict vegan which is not taking any animal product so b12 deficiency so it can be a b12 or a cobalamin defect uh, then another hint is that macrocytic anemia. Macrocytic anemia is seen in B9 as well as also B12 defect. How will we differentiate? I'll tell you later. Then peripheral neuropathy. It is you know, neurological manifestations is a feature of B12, not B9. Then elevated homocysteine. Uh, homocysteine is seen in both B9 and B12. So, if you consider all these together, most probably it should be a cobalamin deficiency. So, how will you investigate this case? I will come to that. How can you differentiate between these two? So, we will just uh, in short discuss about B9 and B12. So, folate B9, B12, cobalamin. The source I have told you, it is the B9, the source is leafy vegetables most commonly. B12, it is the animal products, animal sources. So, uh, strict vegan, uh, the deficiency will be in the B12. Strict non-vegetarian, the deficiency is in B9. Uh, active form of B9 is THFA. Active form of B12, there are two active forms, methyl B12 and Edo B12. So, these are the active form of B12. Now, why there is a deficiency manifestation? Both together, we know that both causes macrocytic anemia. You know, uh, it, there can be megaloblastic anemia. Megaloblast means that it is seen in bone marrow. Macrocyte means it is seen in the peripheral smear. So, macrocytic anemia or megaloblastic anemia. Uh, here, uh, B9 and B12 together comes in a reaction called homocysteine getting converted to methionine. The enzyme is homocysteine methyl transferase. We have already seen this. So, if there is a B12 deficiency, what will happen? If there is a B12 deficiency, 
the methyl thfa is not getting converted to tetrahydrofolic acid so there is a functional deficiency of active form of b9 due to b12 deficiency so we know that the thfa is required as a one carbon carrier uh, in the synthesis of purine in the synthesis of thymidine all these uh, so purine thymidine and all is required for the purine and pyrimidine is required for what dna synthesis so if dna synthesis is affected then nucleocytoplasmic disproportion is there which lead to megaloblast or macrocytes in the peripheral smear or megaloblast in the bone marrow okay so that is why so b12 and b9 both deficiency can cause macrocytic anemia then what is peculiar or how will you differentiate it from b12 one from history and another is that there are certain biochemical markers biomarkers for b12 deficiency that is if there is a b12 deficiency it can be methyl b12 or edo b12 so in methyl b12 uh, if it is defective uh, then uh, one enzyme it affect or it helps is the homocysteine methyl transferase so that we cannot differentiate from b9 because in both these cases there is so if there is b12 or b9 deficiency there is accumulation of homocysteine because that is there required together what what about the edo b12 or adenosyl b12 that is required for another enzyme which is called methyl melonyl coenzyme mutase which convert methyl melonate to succinyl coenzyme so if there is a defect here or if there is this no, due to B12 deficiency, if this enzyme activity is affected, then there is accumulation of methyl malonic acid, right? So, this methyl malonic acid, if it is accumulating, if there is serum methyl malonite is excess, it's a biomarker of, it's a biomarker of, there is, ex, it's a biomarker of B12, right? Uh, not seen in b9 defect so this is how we can differentiate between b9 and b12 so if methyl malonic acid is accumulated it adduct or bind with the myelin basic protein so this we causes finally demyelination demyelination So, this demyelination will affect the peripheral nerves as well as the uh, posterior uh, column and all. So, there is or because of this there is neurological deficit which manifests as subacute combined degeneration. It is seen only in B12 deficiency. So, that is how we can differentiate between these two. So, how can you differentiate already? I have discussed. So, we go into the next question. A 6 year old boy presented to ophthalmology OPD with a whitish raised lesion in the eye. On history taking mother revealed that the child has difficulty in seeing especially in the dark. On treatment there was dramatic improvement in the child which is the vitamin deficiency that was suspected here. So, we know that it is a uh, but delayed adaptation to the dark that is delayed dark adaptation which causes night blindness or nyctalopia it is seen in we all know it is a vitamin a deficiency so what are the deficiency manifestations so vitamin a deficiency can affect the skin or the eyes so first we'll see the eyes the first earliest manifestation is the loss of sensitivity towards the green light which usually the patient will not present i cannot see green light it won't be presented to you usually the first presenting symptom will be even though it is loss of sensitivity to green light what usually present to the clinical department will be uh, poor vision in the night so nyctalopia or night blindness then you can see that the dryness or itching in the eyes because of conjunctiva cirrhosis conjunctiva is cirrhosed or a dryness of the conjunctiva later affect the cornea so corneal cirrhosis then that can lead to ulceration in the cornea and a total degradation of the cornea causes keratomalacia so these are the manifestation in the eyes now in the skin in the skin what we can see is the keratinization excess keratinization 
uh, and uh, epithelial metaplasia where what we can see is that there is a plugging of adnexal glands uh, in the skin which causes follicular hyperkeratosis. So, if there is follicular hyperkeratosis, there is uh, uh, what we can see is the raised lesion or papules on the extensor aspect especially which is called as the uh, phrynoderma otherwise the toad skin. So, these are the common clinical presentation that we can uh, see in a vitamin A deficiency and I should say about one thing that is what is given in the history also the child is uh, having a whitish raised lesion in the eyes. You all know what is it? What is it? It is a case of uh, that is uh, what is called as a bitot spot. Bitot spots. Okay. There is a WHO classification also for the vitamin A deficiency which you should be learning. So, these are uh, how it is very easy for you. So, what are the manifestation we have seen? Elaborate briefly about its metabolism. So, that I will discuss. So, vitamin A has three forms, retinol, retinal and retinoic acid. The retinol is required for reproduction. Retinal is the one which is required for vision and retinoic acid for growth and differentiation. Growth and differentiation that is retinoic acid. Now, what we can see is that uh, considering its metabolism, plant sources and animal sources are there for vitamin A. So, that is in, uh, uh, from the intestine, it is uh, carried in the chylomicron as retinyl esters. Now, this chylomicron uh, go into the, like deposited in the liver. In the liver, it is stored as retinyl esters, as retinyl esters. And it is stored inside the perisinusoidal cells or the ito cells. Now, once when the body require vitamin A, it is carried in the blood by certain transport proteins, which are the transport proteins for uh, the vitamin A. Uh, it is transported as retinol by the retinol binding protein and transthyretin. Now, this is the one which transported to the target organs like the skin, the eyes, etc., where it is doing its function. So, this is very shortly about the metabolism of vitamin A. Going to the next question. A three-year-old child who is reluctant to eat any fruits presented with bleeding gums and reddish spots in both the legs. Which vitamin deficiency should be suspected? What are the clinical features? Why there is bleeding manifestation in this vitamin deficiency? It's a very straightforward question. Everybody will diagnose it. It is uh, not, none but the vitamin C deficiency which causes scurvy. So, the clinical manifestations of vitamin C deficiency are mainly the bleeding manifestations. Why there is bleeding manifestation? Because vitamin C is required for the hydroxylation. Function of vitamin C, the major one is the hydroxylation. So, hydroxylation of proline and the lysine residues uh, and the enzyme for this hydroxylation is prolyl and lysyl hydroxylase. So, if that is affected, uh, remember what happens, the collagen formation, what part of the, or the, which stage of collagen formation is affected, that is uh, the triple helix formation, because for triple helix, the hydroxylation is very essential. So, if that is affected, then triple helix formation is affected. And uh, what about uh, vitamin C? So, definitely it is causing deficiency causes uh, scurvy and it causes defect in collagen synthesis. What about copper? The copper is required for the enzyme lysyl oxidase. Lysyl oxidase uh, causes oxidative deamination of uh, this uh, hydroxylysine as well as the lysine residues which is required for covalent cross-link. So, copper is mainly required for the oxidative deamination by the enzyme lysyl oxidase and that is required for covalent cross-links. Whereas, the hydroxylysine, the hydroxylation, hydroxylysine and hydroxyproline has a major role in the formation of triple helix. So, whatever is affected, the collagen synthesis is affected. So, that is why there is bleeding manifestations. Okay, so the bleeding manifestations can be in the 
in the form of petechiae in the bleeding gums, uh, small hemorrhages in the uh, underneath of the nails which are called as splinter hemorrhages, then hemarthrosis, so many bleeding manifestation. And remember, if the deficiency of vitamin C occur less than six months or in the infants, then uh, it causes Barlow's disease. Then it is called not scurvy, it is called in infants, it is called Barlow's disease. So, discussing the next question, a 3-year-old child presented to pediatric OPD with bone pain protruding abdomen. So, there is uh, visceromegaly is there and there is bone pain. She has no mental retardation. On examination, she is pale, hepatosplenomegaly which is protruding abdomen and bone marrow picture, very classical, where every time you can get this question, what is this? This is the crumpled tissue paper appearance that we see in Gaucher cell. Okay, so this is a case of Gaucher's disease which is coming under sphingolipidosis. Sphingolipidosis. Lipidosis. So, sphingolipidosis is a lysosomal storage disorder. And this is the most common lysosomal storage disorder. And what is that disease called as? This is called Gaucher's disease. Gaucher disease. Okay. What is the, we will just see all the sphingolipidosis together. So, all sphingolipidosis is defect in the degradation of sphingosin containing compounds. Uh, that's a basic defect. So, in, among this, the most common one is the Gaucher disease. These children, uh, they don't have mental retardation, but there is visceromegaly. So, how will you differentiate between various sphingolipidosis when a question is asked? So, that is what is covered in this algorithm. So, the first thing that we have to check is the uh, look for in the history is cherry red spot. Cherry red spot is a classical of almost every sphingolipidosis. But there are three sphingolipidosis where there is no cherry red spot. Actually, two sphingolipidosis. One is actually plus or minus, may or may not be. So, we will see that uh, group. First, we will see which are the uh, sphingolipidosis with no cherry red spot. They are Gaucher disease, Fabris disease and I have told you there is one more which is plus or minus and that is Krabi's disease. Okay. Now, if how will you differentiate among these three? So, next what you have to look for is the visceromegaly. So, if visceromegaly is present, then it is in favor of Gaucher disease. Now, we will discuss a few things about the Gaucher disease. So, there is no cherry red spot and... Um, uh, there is no, uh, that, that there is visceromegaly. So, there is visceromegaly, but there is no cherry red spot. So, in this particular case, one more feature, very characteristic is there is no mental retardation. Okay. Okay. So, in Gaucher disease, the enzyme that is defective is beta glucocerebrosidase. Otherwise, we call it as beta glucosidase. So, here beta glucocerebrosidase is defective. So, glucocerebroside accumulate especially in the extra neural tissue. So, there is no neurological manifestation and there is no intellectual disability. But bone marrow is affected. So, when bone marrow is affected, the blood cell formation is affected. So, there is pancytopenia which in, which in, which in turn causes the thrombocytopenia and hence there is bleeding manifestation. As bone marrow is affected, there is pathological fractures of the long bones. So, I have already told you there is visceromegaly. Now, going to the uh, cherry red spot is not present and there is no visceromegaly. In that comes the fibrous disease. It is a condition that affects only males because fibrous disease is an X-linked recessive condition that is very characteristic. Then the enzyme that is defective there is alpha-galactosidase. Okay, so and, and another very important feature of fibrous disease is angiokeratoma. So, if there is male patient, there is no cherry red spot, there is no visceromegaly, angiokeratoma and very characteristic other features are fibrous crisis almost similar to sickle cell crisis where there is pain and swelling in the peripheries. 
then there is a very characteristic finding in the urinary sediment and that is Maltese gross appearance. All these are hint towards the diagnosis of Fabris disease. So then comes the Krebs, uh, Krebs disease or the Krebs disease. In this case, what we know is that cherry red spot is plus or minus. Now about visceromegaly, what is the thing? Visceromegaly is not seen. There is no visceromegaly. Here the defect is in an enzyme called as beta galactosidase or galactocerebrosidase. Beta galactosidase is beta galactocerebrosidase. Cere cerebrosidase here galactocerebroside accumulate especially in the neurological tissues or neur in, 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 in the neurological tissues it is affected and hence there is severe neurological defect in Krebs disease. So, apart from that one more important feature is that there is an inclusion body called globoid cell inclusion. inclusion okay so that is about the cherry red spot absent now we'll see which are the uh, sphingoliprosis where there is cherry red spot so cherry red spot present uh, what we have to see is the uh, uh, there are various sphingoliprosis under that next what we have to check for is the visceromegaly so if there is visceromegaly then it is pointing towards gm1 gangliosidosis gm1 gangliosidosis here the enzyme defect is again beta galactosidase but remember it is not krebs disease galactosidase the enzyme's name is same but actually the uh, the substrate on which the enzyme acts is different so gm1 gangliosidosis there's there are typical features for gm1 gangliosidosis like long philtrum forontal bowsing etc is there which is very characteristic of gm1 gangliosidosis and again one more feature that is seen in uh, gm1 gangliosidosis is angiokeratoma so the second one is neiman pix disease in neiman pix disease the enzyme that is defective is sphingomyelinase and cherry red spot is present and also visceromegaly then comes the visceromegaly not seen visceromegaly is not seen in gm2 gangliosidosis so in the gm2 gangliosidosis uh, comes the tay sachs disease and the sandoz disease where beta hexosaminidase is affected in tay sachs disease beta hexosaminidase a is affected in sandoz disease beta hexosaminidase a and b are affected so when compare Comparing Tay-Sachs and Sandoz, actually Tay-Sachs does not have hepatosplenomegaly, but Sandoz, there is a chance uh, in some cases there is hepatosplenomegaly given in the books. So basically under GM2, the most important thing that is important disease where there is no visceromegaly is Tay-Sachs. Sandoz, it is plus or minus actually. Then another one where there is no visceromegaly is metachromatic leukodystrophy. In metachromatic leukodystrophy, the enzyme is aryl sulfatase A. Okay, so that is how we differentiate between various sphingolipidosis. Basically, what we have to keep in mind if there is, if it's a case of whether to find out whether it's a case of sphingolipidosis is cherry red spot. So, if there is no cherry red spot either, so most of them are having cherry red spot. So if there is no cherry red spot, keep in mind Gaucher disease, Fabris disease, plus or minus Krebs disease. The rest everything has cherry red spot. A child normal at birth later developed decreased vision, swelling in the inguinal region, protruding abdomen. A, a coarse facial features is there, short stature, frontal bossing. Uh, one additional feature if I am saying adding to this is depressed nasal bridge, intellectual disability is there, the doctor suspected a storage disorder. So what is this? So coarse facial feature if that word is there most probably it is mucopolysaccharidosis. Uh, and um, uh, the mucopolysaccharidosis is a defect in the degradation of what? glycosaminoglycans glycosaminoglycans and where is it happening that is also happening inside the lysosome so mucopolysaccharidosis is also belonging to the class of lysosomal storage disorder so in this particular case short stature is there intellectual disability is there so all these are uh, favoring a diagnosis of mps 
1 h that is hurler disease hurler disease in hurler disease the biochemical defect is alpha l iduronidase okay so remember all the clinical features of mucopolysaccharidosis like coarse facial features then clawing of the hand then protruding tongue because of the larger tongue then gingival hypertrophy uh, depressed nasal bridge or in short what we can say is the gargiolic facies plus there is leukocyte inclusions which i have de detailed described in the major video so i am not going in detail here but this is a very important thing so one case that i have given here is the Hurler disease i will just tell you about the most important thing most important mucopolysaccharosis that is must learn where a scenario can be asked one is the Hurler disease i have described here all features of MPS, the enzyme that is defective here is alpha L iduronidase. Alpha L iduronidase. Then comes the Shy's disease. In the Shy's disease is otherwise MPS 1S. Here the difference is no mental retardation. No mental retardation. Enzyme defect is the same alpha L iduronidase. But in Shy's disease, it's only a partial defect. Then comes the hunter. How will you differentiate? It is an excelling recessive condition. So, only males are affected and hunters are males and males have a clear vision. That is the mnemonic to learn this. So, there is no corneal clouding. What is the enzyme defect here? It is alpha l iduronate sulfatase. These are the three major ones uh, that you should be knowing. That is must learn mucopolysaccharidosis. An infant with the features of Down syndrome admitted in pediatric ward uh, was evaluated for Down syndrome by karyotyping, but the results came to be normal. On further workup, confirmed that the case is a protein targeting disorder. So, which is a protein targeting disorder with the features of Down syndrome like mongoloid facies, then epicanthal folds, then white palpebral fissure. Uh, the slanting eyes, every features, almost every brush field, sports, all the features of um, a Down syndrome are there. But this is not Down syndrome. So, this is a peroxisomal targeting disorder. It is called Zellweger syndrome. Zellweger syndrome Selvega syndrome. Here, the mutation is in a peroxisomal targeting sequence called PTS is affected. So, the peroxisomal enzymes are not able to reach the peroxisome. So, defect here is uh, there is decreased peroxisomal oxidation of very long chain fatty acids. And there is decreased alpha oxidation because alpha oxidation also takes place in the peroxisomes. So, these are the major. So, as a result, there is accumulation of very long chain fatty acid. And as the peroxisomal enzymes are not reaching the peroxisome, there is decreased biogenesis of peroxisome. Okay, so, these are all the relevant uh, clinic uh, investigation where very long chain fatty acids are accumulated. Then branched chain fatty acids are accumulated because of defect in alpha oxidation. So, that are the relevant investigation. Then remember one more targeting disorder that can be asked is eye cell disease. Eye cell disease, it is a lysosomal targeting disorder. So, how will the uh, scenario, clinical scenario, what we get is similar to mucopolysaccharidosis because the lysosomal functions are affected. So, there is, it is similar to mucopolysaccharidosis. And uh, what is the target, uh, the mutation cost here? It is due to a defect in mannose 6-phosphate. It is the address to the organelle called lysosomes. So, that is why it is a 
eye cell disease or inclusion cell disease it's a lysosomal targeting disorder and remember one more thing in the selvage syndrome there is one more name for selvage syndrome which is also asked that is cerebro hepato renal disease so that is another name for selvage syndrome so these are the two targeting disorders that you should be learning uh, another question uh, is a patient brought from tribal area in a comatose state. His wife told that the complaint started as vomiting after consuming of fruit when he went to the forest for fetching firewood. His blood examination revealed low blood glucose, uh, Rothera's test was negative, symptomatic treatment is given and the condition improved. So, what is the fruit which is causing hypoglycemia and no ketosis? So, that is called Jamaican vomiting sickness. Okay, so it is a case of Jamaican vomiting sickness. So, why there is no hype, why there is hypoglycemia and no ketosis? So, a key fruit is a fruit which contain a toxin called hypoglycin. This affect the one of the enzyme uh, in beta oxidation that is uh, the very first enzyme. So, beta oxidation is affected. So, if beta oxidation is affected, we know that there is decreased synthesis of acetyl coenzyme A. So, definitely there is no uh, starting substrate for ketone body. So, there is no ketosis. Definitely and the next important aim of beta oxidation is to provide ATP for gluconeogenesis. So, there is no ATP production. So, gluconeogenesis is affected. So, what happens if the glycogen stores? So, when the glycogen stores of the patient is uh, depleted, then the next source is gluconeogenesis. For that ATP is required, for ATP beta oxidation is required. So, as the hydroxy acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase, which is the uh, which is the enzyme that is affected that is beta oxidation is affected so what will happen there is no uh, atp so there is no gluconeogenesis possible which result in hypoglycemia so hypoglycemia and no ketosis the suspicion should be a defect in beta oxidation not only in jamaican vomiting sickness one more scenario that can be asked is medium chain acyl coenzyme a dehydrogenase so, in this scenario, usually it will be a child uh, presented with um, uh, tiredness or seizures or coma or any features of hypoglycemia, especially the child is fasting and there will be uh, in the history it will be given there is uh, hypoglycemia and Rotheras test is negative. The doctor advised a low fat diet, low fat and a high low fat high carbohydrate diet low fat uh, high carbohydrate low fat diet is advised and it should be given frequently because the child should not fast here because of it's a medium chain acyl coenzyme a dehydrogenase so in the previous case a key fruit is affecting which enzyme hypoglycine affect acyl coenzyme a dehydrogenase So, the next case which I have told you is almost similar to a defect in beta oxidation but that is in the medium chain acyl coenzyme A that is the uh, enzyme that act on medium chain fatty acid. So, that is MCAD almost similar there is no beta oxidation hypoglycemia no ketosis suspicion should be a defect in beta oxidation. So, a 9 month old child strict vegan brought, by the, brought to the pediatrician due to muscle weakness. There were uh, strict dietary beliefs for the parents so that they did not give any vitamin supplement. Uh, there is an image like the x-ray picture of the knee revealed cupping and widening of the metaphysis. And the child is very fair skin. They do not expose to the sunlight. So, the, from the sunlight which is the vitamin that is synthesized, it is vitamin D. Again, this is also one of the endogenously synthesized vitamin from what? 7 dehydro cholesterol so it is synthesized so actually it is not a vitamin 
because it is endogenously synthesized the another one was niacin which is synthesized from tryptophan so uh, we all know that this is a case of rickets uh, so all the features of rickets are very important uh, because uh, I have already discussed that in the major videos, I am not discussing it here. But remember, rickets is a very, very important question that you can expect. What is the basic biochemical defect in ricket? It is because of uh, there is decreased vitamin D, the calcium, calcium uh, level is low. So, because of decreased calcium and uh, decreased phosphate, so what happens is that the bone mineralization, bone mineralization is affected. So osteoid formation is defective and hence there is so many skeletal manifestation for the rickets. So that is very shortly about rickets. You have to read more about vitamin D metabolism and other features of uh, rickets its uh, images are also very frequently asked it's a very common topic very commonly discussed so that's uh, why i am not discussing in detail here so detailed discussion is there in the uh, in the major videos so to conclude let me conclude with a quote of bruce lee who said i fear not a man who practiced 10000 kicks one but a man who practice one kick 10,000 times. So, revision is the key to success. Revise, revise, revise. Success is yours. All the best. Thank you.